General Amir Avivi. General Avivi is the founder and CEO of Israel's Defense and Security Forum, IDSF, also known by its Hebrew name, the tongue twister, Habit Chonistim, comprised of more than 17,000 senior reserve and retired officers, commanders, and operators from all branches of the Israeli uh, security establishment. It educates and advocates on behalf of national security policies that will ensure Israel's existence and prosperity for generations to come. General Levivi retired from the IDF in 2017 with more than 30 years of military counterterrorism and national security experience. In his last role, he was head of the auditing and consulting department of the Israeli defense establishment. And I have to admit, I didn't quite know what that did, but clearly it oversees auditors in areas including budgeting, procurement, projects, bids, cyber, logistics, infrastructure, and operations, which means that he's got experiences understanding the establishment in all of those places. Um, really a Renaissance man. In the Corps of Engineers, he held various command positions, leading soldiers in um, combating terrorism. He served as a brigade commander, a deputy division commander, and head of the military school of engineers. Prior to that, he served in the uh, chief of staffs, uh, chief of staffs aide de camp, where he was at the heart of the policy making process in the Israeli government and defense establishment. So then he retired, but he didn't really retire because uh, aside from his work at IS, IDSF, General Levivi also serves as the principal of the New State Solutions Working Group and an expert lecturer at the Miriam Institute. I will confess, I did not know what the Miriam Institute was when I started, but I looked it up and I loved this line from their, um, from their definition. The Miriam Institute champions rigorous debate about Israel led first and foremost by Israelis who hold diverse opinions, but who are all unified by their dedication to the continuing flourishing of our country as a Jewish and democratic state. For those of you who know the, the JPC, we are big advocates of people not interfering in the domestic or foreign policy concerns of friendly democratic countries that can do it on their own. So we are really big on, we stay out of your business. And I love the Miriam Institute's statement that Israelis go first and foremost for Israeli security. Um, the flourishing of Israel, however, and now we get to the point, is really dependent on a plan for dealing with Iran in both its nuclear and conventional um, malign capabilities. And that is, I know, at the top of Israel's priority hierarchy. Missiles from Gaza, yes, but without a plan for Iran, uh, the future doesn't look very good. So I am very pleased to turn the floor over to you, General Levy, to talk to us about Iran and about plans and how Israel and the United States can work together to deal with this. Um, I think that one of the important things before talking about Iran uh, that unites so many officers and commanders and operators in Israel, think about it. We founded this organization three years ago, and in three years, more than 17,000 Israeli officers, commanders, operators joined, and it's growing exponentially. IDSF today uh, has a huge impact on the Israeli society. We deploy thousands of officers to the pre-army programs and to the high schools. We educate the young generation in really reviving Zionistic Jewish values because we believe that national security is first and foremost about national values, about a deep connection to our country, to our history, to our heritage, to Zionism. Without spirit, no tank and no airplane can help. And I think that uh, probably, and uh, not only in Israel, I think around the Jewish world, the biggest challenge, the biggest problem we are facing is our values, our spirit. You know, we are living in an era of a huge paradox. On one hand, looking in a 4,000 years perspective, since the days of King David and King Solomon, the Jewish people have never been so strong, so, so prosperous. I don't think ever in the history of the people of Israel, we have had so many Jews in Israel, such a strong army and economy and high tech. Everything is, really seems to be working uh, for us. 
even here, you know, looking at Jewish communities who are sitting in this very fancy uh, location. And yet, everywhere I go, in Israel and around the Jewish world, people are worried. People are uncertain about the future of the Jewish people, are uncertain about the future of Israel. Why is that? And the answer is, we are in some deep crisis of identity. I think that in 48, when we started building our country and we fought the independence war, in the independence war, we were 90% spirit, 10% capabilities, and we won. In 67, in the Six Day War, there was a moment in our new history where spirit and capabilities go to a certain peak together and we defeated the way we did. The armies around us and had this huge historical win in the Six Day War. And I think that today, and I discussed that with Prime Minister Netanyahu a week ago, we're 90% physics, 10% spirit. And with that, we cannot win. I think that the challenges that we are experiencing is that it's very simple. You know, in every great story, there is a hero and there is a villain. And the story of the Jewish people is the greatest of all. And it seems that people are forgetting that we are the heroes of our own story, not the villains. Heroes. And people treat themselves as villains. And you know, being a Jew really was always hard throughout history. But Jews thrived and succeeded and prospered because we knew that we're special. We knew that we are like the Delta Force of the nations. Sayeret Matkal. And when you are in a special unit, art goes with the job. You know, you're in a special unit, it's hard. But you know that you're special, you feel proud. But what happens when it's still hard and you think you're in a shitty unit? Then why bother? And we're, use, we're losing millions of Jews. One of the big challenges my organization has undertaken. No, our, our, what we do in the army as officers, what we specialize in is building units pride, units resilience. Because when you go to war and you go to operation, in order to have the unit strong and ready for war, it needs to be united, it needs to be proud, it needs to be resilient. And we know how to build this capability. And with this knowledge, we approach uh, the young generation in Israel, and now we're reaching also to the Jewish communities to give them the tools to know how to build their pride, this Jewish pride again, because uh, coping with anti Semitism and everything that's going on with the legitimation and BDS and, and all of that, it's not about just talking to the mind giving information, it's about the heart, it's about bringing excitement, remembering who we are. And this is probably the biggest challenge we are, uh, we are facing uh, today. And, and we really, all of us, we, we really need to deal with it. When you take the whole concept of Zionism, and Judaism, and start breaking it, the moment you put the first hole, this concept, it's like a dam where you just put a hole, and then you have water going out from this place and pretty soon from this place and this place, and the dam, dam eventually collapsing. This is post Zionism. You cannot break the whole idea of Zionism into pieces. It needs to be intact and we need to learn and teach how you can keep 100% of your beliefs and values, but when you deal with uh, specific problems, whether it's the Palestinian, uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict or Iran, which we'll talk now, um, 
addresses on a practical level. You don't need to give up your identity to solve problems. And Jews are mixing between their values and problem solving. I am an expert on, the, on, on solutions for the Israeli Palestinian conflict. I have many different solutions, very interesting, out of the box. I never ever mix my thinking about solutions with the values which are whole. I know where the people of Israel, I know who the land of Israel belong to, I know our connection and our history. And from this point and thinking also about what will secure Israel for generations to come, this is how we approach problems. When I come to speak with the young generation in Israel, me and our many officers, I'm invited a lot to, to speak about solutions. So usually I arrive to the, the briefing and I say, listen guys, I, I'm going to talk to you about different solutions, but you know, I cannot really talk about a solution because I cannot start talking about solutions because I'm not sure we agree on the problem. What problem are we trying to solve? And I'm telling you for sure, we don't agree on the problem. And then I say to them, you know what? But before I talk about the problem, does anybody of here know to say what is needed to secure Israel for generations to come? What are the parameters? People usually don't really discuss it seriously. It's a big discussion. So we need to understand what is needed for Israel to, to be secure. You cannot start talking about other people before we understand what we need. You know, we are probably many businessmen here. I'm sure that you don't go on a negotiation if you don't know beforehand what are your red lines. Israel has no red lines because we're not discussing seriously this issue. But before we even talk about what is needed to secure Israel for generations to come, we really, really need to discuss who we are, what are our values, what is Zionism all about. I can tell you, I talk to the best young people we have in Israel. I stand before a room of 40 youngsters, 19 years old. I ask them, define me Zionism. If there is one guy or woman that can define, that's, that's the good scenario, usually none. We are not teaching Zionism and patriotism in our education program, and this is needed. This is why now that we are doing it, every month we have more and more demand in high schools and in uh, pre-army programs and in social media. Uh, and in TV interviews, we, today we dominate Israeli mainstream media because people need this. And I can tell you that every time we talk to the young generation about who we are and about our values, they ignite, they, they like enlighten, they need this, they need a connection. They want to be connected, they want to know, they want to feel that they are part of something big, much bigger than them. And what we do is not only we brief them again and again and, and talk to them, they have a million questions, but because we are a grassroots movement, we bring them on board the movement. We have thousands and thousands of youngsters joining. And this way we can shape their understanding and continue this discussion in the long term through media, through social media, through meetings and so on. So first and foremost, our biggest challenge of all as Jews and as Israelis is spirit, is our values before we talk about anything else. And now I would like to address uh, the Iranian issue. Iran is not a new issue. I've been dealing with Iran for a long time, but something really basic has changed in the last year. Um, you know, we had yeah, a year ago, the, the Russian-Ukrainian war, 
and because of this war, very harsh sanctions, and rightly so, were imposed on the Russians. We also have sanctions on the Chinese and also on the Iranians and also on North Korea. And the dynamics of this process has brought the East to get closer and closer together. China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, all of these countries are getting closer together in their attempt, and it's a successful attempt to overcome Western sanctions. Now, because the East has grown to huge economies like India, like China, Russia, Korea, <laughs> they are able to create their own economical ecosystem and overcome most of uh, the Western sanctions. Now, when they look at the West, they say, okay, well, we're able to overcome the sanctions. The West is powerful, but with zero willingness to use power. And in this reality, with the East, we can do pretty much whatever we want. Who will stop us? So you see the Chinese aggression in the Pacific, you see the Russian aggression in Europe, you see Iranian expansion in the Middle East. And this has worsened dramatically in the last uh, year because Russia has become very dependent uh, on Iran and it's getting closer. The director of the CIA already in December, now we are in May, said we are witnessing a Russian-Iranian front emerging in the Middle East, but it's much bigger than a Russian-Iranian front. It's a Russian-Iranian, Chinese, North Korean front uh, in the Middle East. China is backing up economically Russia and Iran. And Iran is the one being aggressive and expanding in the Middle East. The Russians are pretty much left Syria. They were a stabilizing factor in Syria for a long time. They have moved almost all their forces to Ukraine. And as a result, Iran is much freer uh, to maneuver and the uh, act in Syria, weaponizing uh, Hezbollah, weaponizing Hamas and Islamic Jihad, uh, continuing to weaponize the Houthis in Yemen and the militias in Iraq. Iran is everywhere. How big is Iranian way of thinking? Let's take, for example, Morocco. Morocco did a peace agreement with Israel. And following that, they are the first Arab countries that signed a military MOU with Israel. And it's interesting. How come Morocco suddenly signs a military MOU? If you see the number of times the chief of staff of Israel visited Morocco and the Air Force commander and the ground forces commander, very tight. So I sat with one of the Morocco leaders and asked him, you know, what's going on? Why? Why are we doing this? I knew the answer, but I wanted to hear it. I wanted to hear it from him. And he said, look, the Iranians, through Hezbollah, are weaponizing Polisario. Polisario is the organization in West Sahara fighting uh, Morocco. Hezbollah and Iran are weaponizing Algeria, a big enemy uh, of Morocco. Morocco is really far away. Why, why is Iran bothering to try to bring Shia into Morocco, to weaponize Polisario, to, to work with Algeria? And when you open the global map, the answer is there. It's very simple. Morocco sits on the Gibraltar Straits. If you control this place, you control world trade. So look where Iran is operating. It's op operating in Hormoz Straits. It's building up a force in Yemen to control Bab el Mandeb Straits. And it's operating in Morocco to control Gibraltar. If they control these three places, they control the globe the whole globe, the whole trade. They are also um, active in South America. They are weaponizing Venezuela. This is the new Cuba. This is, Mar this is Iran, they think globally. They are a global danger. It's not only about Israel. Now they have been building these capabilities for a long time while experiencing harsh sanctions uh, at some of the times. It took them a long time to build these capabilities they have, but now they are reach, reaching a point with the backup of Russia and China, 
that they might be feeling empowered enough and strong enough to challenge Israel. And in, and in this reality, we have four possible scenarios, which I'll discuss shortly. The first scenario is a scenario that is, I would say, the dream scenario for Israel, and also a scenario that is um, related to Israel's strategy in the last few decades. Israel's strategy in the last few decades is very, very similar to the Truman Doctrine, a strategy of containment. Uh, the, the idea is that we we'll try to prolong uh, times between wars. We we'll try to prevent big wars. We'll enable the Israel to, to develop, to thrive, to prosper. And indeed, if we just look at the last 20 years, most of them, by the way, Netanyahu was prime minister, and he's a very strong supporter of this strategy. Look where Israel was 20 years ago. Look where it is today. Economically, dramatic growth. Technologically, peace agreements, relation, international relations, the army, everything has gotten much, much stronger in the last 20 years. What happened to our enemies at the same time? Arab Spring, collapse, really bad economical situation. Lebanon is hardly functioning as a country. Syria is a mess. Gaza also not in a very good shape. Iran is, you know, with all this in internal turmoil and economical problems and hunger and water shortage. Many, many problems. Egypt has undergone a huge turmoil and then now also economically then is in a really bad shape. Jordan, so the supporters of the containment approach are saying, you know, guys, look, in the long term, we're winning. This is actually working. We're getting stronger and stronger, and they're getting weaker and weaker. But we all feel that that may be true, but something is changing. Something is not the same. So maybe, miraculously, this will actually work. Who knows? Maybe in a year, Iran will collapse. Maybe Lebanon will go into civil war. Maybe the day after Abbas, the Palestinian Authority will collapse and there will be a civil war also in uh, the Palestinian, uh, on the Palestinian side. Many things can happen, but we cannot count on that. We need to take in account two other scenarios which we need to take seriously. One scenario, I call, I call it Yom Kippur scenario. Yom Kippur scenario means that the Iranians feel they're strong enough, they have weaponized enough Hezbollah and Hamas and all these forces. They are emboldened by the fact that the Russians are backing them up and the Chinese economy and so on, and the absence of America in the Middle East. And they launch a surprise attack on Israel. And this attack will include tens of thousands of rockets, missiles, UAVs, commando on our border. It's all in high readiness and it can be quite surprising because it's not armored brigades which take weeks and months to organize like Russia did before they invaded Ukraine. Nobody could miss that. When you shoot missiles, it's all ready to shoot. You just press the button, that's it. You know that two years ago in Jerusalem day, which is today, Hamas shot our capital, it shot Jerusalem. The army knew about that an hour before. That's the level of alert we had. And one hour, what can we do in one hour? Nothing. So imagine that maybe one hour before we know that there is a whole war. And not only we're going to get shot from all over the place, maybe this will also incite Israeli Arabs as it happened two years ago, and we'll have uh, some kind of uh, uprisal inside Israel. So this is, one scenario, one Yom Kippur scenario. The other scenario is a six day war scenario. In this scenario, Israel initiates a war. We know that the Iranians are moving towards nuclear capabilities. We know that it's just a matter of time until Israel needs to take a decision to do something about it. 
You know, I've been a long, a long time in the army, many years. What happened this year, I never saw before. The army, you know, every year you, you, there's this budget discussion for years. Netanyahu has a uh, cut budget to the army in order to allocate budget to the economy, to civilian issues. This year, Netanyahu said to the army, okay, what do you need? The army put a number. They got 100% what they asked without any discussion. Never happened in Israel, not even in the 50s. Okay, this, this means that the Israeli government means business. They want to prepare the army for war. They are giving the army everything they need to prepare for war. And, and also telling to the army, guys, no excuses. Tell us what you need to win. This is what you need here. Thank you. Don't tell me afterwards that you're not ready. Take everything. And this is what's happening now. The army is getting ready, ready for war. Now, in both scenarios, and this is something, the reason why I'm coming again and again to Washington, to Capitol Hill and meeting with the Biden's advisors and so on, is to explain what I'm going to say now, and this is very important. Whether it's the Iranian attacking us, whether it's we attacking Iran, if it's just the both of us, this will result with the regional war that will impact the whole globe economically. This will bring recession to the whole world. This will bring oil prices, they will go crazy. Trade routes will be affected. It's much bigger scenario than the Russian-Ukrainian war in the way it can affect the globe, because this is the Middle East we are talking about. Why it's important to emphasize that? Because in many occasions when I came to, to the Senate or to the Congress, and I sit with the biggest supporters of Israel, and they say to us, you know, you Israelis, we, we support you, you do whatever you need to do. You need to attack Iran, go for it, you know, we are behind you. But they don't understand the, the consequences. If we do it alone, this is regional war. I'm not talking about what's the consequences for Israel, but nobody cares. <laughs> what will be the consequences for every American? Everyone will feel that. By the way, not only Americans, Europeans, and also the Chinese, and also the Russians, everybody will be impacted by such a war. And we tell them that. In, in us trying to convince them to stop Iran. But there is also a fourth scenario. So we talked about containment and maybe it will work. We talked about the Yom Kippur scenario and a six day war scenario, but there's a fourth scenario. And that's the best scenario we can think about. And in this scenario, the US actually steps forward, takes leadership, builds a coalition with Israel and the Sunni world poses a credible military threat on Iran. And in doing so, the following things will happen. One, Saudi Arabia is willing to sign a peace agreement with Israel. And not only sign an historical peace agreement with Israel, but because Saudi Arabia is the leader of the Sunni world, they are willing to expand this uh, agreement also to Pakistan and Indonesia, all the way to the Pacific and to Oman. This can be a huge peace agreement. They are willing to enhance oil production and take prices down. They are willing to open, open new routes of commerce. When President Biden visited Israel, he did a Zoom uh, with India, uh, Israel, and UAE, talking about the need of solving the crisis of uh, the global uh, supply chain. And he suggested opening a new chain directly from India to UAE and from there by, by uh, land through uh, Saudi Arabia and Jordan all the way to Israel. It takes a month of global trade. It's dramatic. But the Chinese saw that, said, you know what, that's a good route actually. We'll take it over. <laughs> and this is why they are now pressuring the Saudis to join them. This is what they're trying to expand. They want this food. So who is going to control this food? So if the US steps forward, 
then the U.S. will be able to really build a huge coalition, Sunni, Israeli, uh, and also control this uh, trade, global trade route, route and stabilize the region. Why, why it will stabilize? It will stabilize because even, let's say, that we actually need to attack together Iranian installations. First of all, it's not boot on the ground, okay? It's not 20 years in Afghanistan or in Iraq. When we talk about the US, Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, this is a 24 hour, 48 hour operation. We are able to destroy everything the Iranians have. And that's it. In this scenario, when it's a coalition led by America, Hezbollah and Hamas, Will stay put, they're not going to challenge America. They're not stupid. And, and this will also affect something else. This will, will affect the US deterrence, not only in the Middle East, but globally. Look what Israel did last week. In the last few months, Israel's deterrence was destroyed because of the, all the political, everything that's going on around the judicial reform. And the reservists that they said that they wouldn't serve, and it was like the army is falling apart, the society is falling apart. I, I, I interview a lot in Arab stations. Usually I, I sit um, in the studio and on Zoom, I have an Iranian and a Saudi and we have discussions. I never saw uh, in, in these discussions what I saw two weeks ago, the way they talked about Israel. You are done. You are gone. Iran is going to destroy you, and so on. And really, I, I, I thought to myself, that's it. I mean, it's just a matter of time until we have a war because they feel that we're weak. And then look what Israel did. Israel took the weakest organization, not the Hamas, not the Hezbollah, not Iran. They took the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the weakest link, and we destroyed them. We toppled all of their leadership. In four days, we toppled the first three leaders, then the successors came, we toppled them as well. And then we destroyed most of their capabilities in Gaza. And in four days, we shifted the whole thing around. Everybody is deterred now. Hamas is looking at it, uh, Hezbollah, Iran, and they're saying what they can do to them, they can do to us, the same. And, and we, did, we got maximum deterrence with minimum price. And what we are saying to the administration is the same. Why challenge the Chinese directly? Why bring so many forces to the Pacific? Why build these bases now in the Philippines? Are you seriously willing to fight directly China on the Pacific Ocean? Why don't we target the weak link? The weak link is Iran. And if the US challenges Iran, this will impact and will deter also China in the Pacific and also Russia in Europe. You don't need to go straight and, and challenge the Russians and the Chinese to get deterrence. You can do it much easier by challenging the Iranians. But there are other benefits to this leadership. And it reminds me of a meeting I had with Ron Dermer a few weeks ago. And Ron was telling me, that he spoke to a, a very high official in the administration. And this official was say, saying to him, you know, Ron, you Israelis, you are talking to the Russians, you are talking to the Chinese, we, we don't like that. And Ron told him, you know, it's like a boy dating a girl, but he's also dating other boys. And all he needs to do is put the ring, that's it. So why don't you guys put the ring on Israel's finger? <laughs> And, and putting the ring on Israel's fingers mean, means America stepping forward, saying, guys, we're serious. We're going to you know, work with you and defend you and the Sunnis together. We are going to challenge the Iranians. We are not going to let them have nuclear weapons. And if we need to attack, we'll attack. We do everything in, uh, we need to do to prevent. Now, if the ring is put on our finger, what we'll do as Israelis, at that stage, we'll completely disregard the Russians and also the Chinese, and we'll bring all of our capabilities to Ukraine. So 
think about what will happen in the uh, Russian Ukrainian war if Israel really brings all, if we bring all of our capabilities there. And also what will happen to Russia if we take out of the equation Iran. Russians cannot fight today in Ukraine without Iranian backup. So if we isolate Iran, Russia will be in deep trouble. And then we'll, we have a big, strong uh, ally that will be taken care of by, by this uh, coalition. So really looking forward, it, it's not a miracle and the Middle East will collapse by itself. It's either a regional war or stability and prosperity. And, and it's all dependent on the US policy. And Israel, you know, we as Israelis, we prepare for all scenarios. If we need to defend ourselves by ourselves, we'll do that. It will be costly, it will, you know, it will, it will be a war, not the first war we have encountered. Um, but uh, we'll do that. But I still feel that there is time to convince the administration to really understand that they're losing the Middle East. I, I, I was here in March. I said the same things in March. We, we flew back to Israel. Two weeks later, Saudi Arabia renewed relations with Iran. And this deal was brokered by the Chinese. And then they renewed relationships with the Syrians. And now Jordan renewed relations with Iran. The Middle East is changing much faster than the decision making here. And this needs to change because if we are we continue waiting, we might find a completely different Middle East in the coming future. Thank you. Question. Do I go a technical question? Do I need to repeat these questions or only the ones you give me from the committee? As long as you project, you should be fine. Sorry? As long as you project, you should be fine. Okay. And hear you the first question. General, as always, it's great to hear from you. Thank you for the moral part you shared when talking about these issues. I have a very specific question about the refueling tankers that Israel has already purchased from the United States. There's four. And they're scheduled for delivery in a few years, actually. And of course, Israel would really like to have those sooner, and we're working on that with litigation. But the question is: in the absence of those four tankers, is it really viable for Israel to reach Iran and do the attacks that you're talking about? And can you just tell me, just reassure me that there's still a way to do it if that's if that's what you think? And I, I'm just I feel like in my talks with the American administration that we need to inject some urgency in getting those four tanker deliveries speeded up. So definitely to be very helpful, we get them uh, before. But um, I must tell you, you know, when, when I became made the camp of the Chief of General Staff, it was the first time that I went from the tactical level to see everything that the Prime Minister, Minister of Defense and Chief of Staff see, the whole picture. Okay. And when I saw the whole picture, participated in different, you know, special operations, what I thought at the time was, you know, I've never seen a movie producer that is able to capture and imagine what Israel is able to do. It's beyond imagination. Everything we think about is what we can imagine. But what the IDF can do is beyond imagination, okay? And we have capabilities that are, and I talked about it, by the way, in this Arab show, and these guys were saying you are finished, you know? And I, and I told them, you, you really don't understand how powerful we are. And the day we'll have to challenge Iran, we'll really destroy them, okay? Um, and I told them that the fact that we are a peaceful nation, we don't seek wars, no. But when we have to defend ourselves, we have, um, not, which I can share with you, but then I have to kill you all. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll do it on another occasion. So let me add on to Dan's question. Um, General Carrillo of CENTCOM has been in Israel 
seven times since he took over, which is only about a year ago, without telling us things for which you need to kill us. How are Israel's operational relations with CENTCOM? How well do you guys work? I know you're working in the Red Sea. I know there's a lot of stuff going on here. How good is that relationship? Yeah. So I think it's an excellent relation. Uh, it was a very wise decision to move the idea from Yukon to CENTCOM. This enables us to coordinate very, very closely uh, with uh, CENTCOM, with uh, the other uh, countries, like the Emirates and Saudi Arabia and so on. Um, I think that on, on the operational level of the armies, there is a deep understanding of what needs to be done. And it, the problem is that it's not reflecting to the politics. It needs to, to and although the, the American army and also the CIA understand the issues, uh, it's still not reflecting the way it's supposed to be uh, talking about uh, the administration. On the operational level, we see a much better maritime coordination. We see a much better air defense coordination, but we need to go much beyond that. Do you have a question on the computer? Yeah, we have uh, an online question. Um, can you talk about the domestic political challenges here in the US to forming a stronger US-led coalition in the Middle East? I'm not an expert on American politics. No one is. Believe me that Israel is, uh, is, is, is tough enough. But I think, I, I say this, I'm a big believer in real interest. And I think that everything that I talked about here, it's not about serving what's best for Israel interest. It's really talking about what's best for American interest. And for American interests, it's crucial to show leadership in the Middle East and stabilize the Middle East. If this Middle East won't be stabilized and we won't challenge the Iran, or at least stop their uh, aggression, every American will feel that at the, at the end of the day. Um, so I, I don't really understand um, why things are looking the way they're looking now. To me, it doesn't make sense. I mean, if I was president, I would think about this peace agreement, huge peace agreement. Politically, it's supposed to be very beneficial about taking down oil prices, about opening new routes of commerce, about showing deterrence. How is it not beneficial for, even politically, right? Um, and this is what we're talking about. You know, I'm not a politician, but, but I can see even on the political level why it makes sense. So let's add on to that question a little bit. You don't want to talk about U.S. domestic politics, but look at Iran for a minute. They've been having um, demonstrations and strikes and all kinds of internal upheaval for two years now. What hope do you have, if any? that the Iranian revolution will come up this way instead of the US and Israel having to bring it down from the other side? A good question. And I think that what I'm suggesting about moving a coalition being strong on Iran will impact dramatically the Iranian society. The Iranian society today looks at the West and says the West doesn't care. The West is not willing to challenge this uh, you know, Iranian regime. And this encourages them. They're not getting help. But if you put a coalition in front of the Iranians and challenge the, the regime, then they will feel empowered also to do what they need to do. That might bring actually the Iranians uh, down, you know, without even needing to fight. But the West needs to do something in order to challenge the regime. So someone in a, in a meeting like this suggested to us that the way to tell if the Iranian revolution could be successful or is rising is if you see defections from the police, the army, or the Basiji Guard. Um, if the forces of repression start to crumble inside, you have better. Do you see any evidence that the military forces or police forces are changing their attitude? Not to the level that we would like to see. I think that the, the regime is being very harsh on these protesters and they're not organized. They don't have a central leadership. They're not getting the assistance they could get uh, from the West, and, and this is to be changed. When you decide to go after this regime, you do it in many different ways. 
wouldn't be the first time that America, you know, like intervened in another country. Uh, we saw it in South America in multiple occasions, Central America. Why not do it with the Iranians? Can definitely help. Do you see, do you see current signs so that the Americans are now starting to take this route more seriously in terms of coalition? Or do you see just continual stalling? I mean, I know you're saying like it's going slow, but is there still hope that it's going to pick up? I think that I'm hoping. I mean, reality is so strong, and what's going on now with the you know this uh, Chinese uh, projection on the Middle East and uh, Russia and renewal of relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran is supposed to send a clear message to the administration. Now, the administration is talking about possible peace agreement, but Saudi Arabia will never do that without uh, having uh, uh, America standing strong. They won't give the president this present without getting what they need. They need protection. They need commitment. Um, good afternoon, Ariel Cohen, the Atlantic Council. Uh, just to reinforce what you said about Saudi wanting protection, um, I had a conversation with a senior Gulf official not too long ago, uh, and uh, he said uh, Biden didn't call us when uh, the Houthis were bombing UAE. The Saudis could not get the guarantees vis-a-vis -vis Iran that they needed and as a result, you got the Saudi-Iranian agreement with the Chinese umbrella on top. Yeah, it's also so, another thing. It's, so it's a I have a question about that, sure. and I have um, a piece of information for you. The question is, if this agreement between Tehran and Saudi persists and the Iranians don't violate it and don't screw it up, would Saudi close it? their eyes and ears if uh, Khalavir flies east and the Saudis don't hear it in view of that agreement. The piece of information is that I was at a launch at the Council of Foreign Relations uh, on the record launch. So the gentleman knew that it's recorded. And the gentleman who is the ranking Republican, he's a uh, ranking uh, Democrat, so the House is majority Republican. There is a leading Democrat on the Armed Services Committee. And I raised the hand and said, so the Biden administration said they would not allow Iran to have nuclear weapons. How are you going to achieve that? And he said, well, we don't have good relations with Iran. Russia and China do. We don't talk to them, but they're in a better position to achieve that than us. And other than that, we don't want a war. We had 20 years of wars. So the Israelis are shit out of luck. Basically, that was the message. She didn't say that. But so in view of your best case scenario, so, sorry, sir, until 24, I just don't see it. I don't, have, I don't know if we have the time. Maybe, yes. Maybe it's sad that we'll have to attack the Iranians alone. Um, but uh, I think that. The challenge uh, really with the Democrats is one is overcoming their hostility towards Saudi Arabia. They are very hostile to NBC. And, and really, when you look at real politics and the need to be in good relations with Saudi Arabia, there is a need to overcome this uh, hostility. And yes, the US has wasted years and years in Iraq and Afghanistan with zero results. <laughs> boots on the ground and what we are trying to say is this is different this is not about wasting 20 years with boots on the ground we don't expect you to train anybody we don't expect you to send troops this is about an airstrike one airstrike major airstrike it's very different and we need to understand how different this is um, and why why it's uh, needed but yes maybe you know Maybe it will be only in 24. Bob, your question. Yeah, during, I, I don't recall during your talk, uh, 
that you, you, you mentioned, I think, almost every region of the globe except for Europe. And certainly, you know, the Biden administration's, uh, you know, one of the feathers they wear in their cap is renewed NATO in, in, in part of Ukraine. Can you give us any insight as, uh, and, and I know from Shoshana's reports and JPC publications that Europe has been at best lukewarm, if not cold to the ideas you're talking about. But can you give us any further insight into Europe or NATO and whether that may be either affecting the Biden administration's views or whether there's any, you know, how that will play into the whole scenario? Yeah. No, one of the interesting things last week when we dealt with this operation in Gaza, we hardly heard the Europeans. Usually when we operate in Gaza, you know, immediately they all get walked out and everything. And said on TV that one of the reasons is that they have a war on their continent. Suddenly they see a war very close and this changes the whole perspective. And now they are really busy building back their armies and they are doing this with a lot of Israeli assistance. All of our industries are in Europe now, helping them build. They are talking about conscription again, which they didn't have for a long time. Some of the countries already renewed conscription. Um, I, I was in Italy a few weeks ago and we talked to, uh, to them about the buildup of course the Iranians are doing along the northern part of Africa, Libya, all this region, Iran is uh, very active. So this is in their backyard and this is also going to affect uh, the process of uh, all, all these Africans moving in, into Europe. Iran is affecting that as well. They might bring into Europe many jihadists this way. And we really, we expect from Europe one thing, talking about the Iranians is to, um, talking about the JCPOA, uh, to snap back, snap back from the agreement and impose sanctions again. This is what Europe can contribute to this effort. And I, I believe that if America will tell them, listen, this is what needs to be done Again, in the context of how this will affect the Russian-Ukrainian war and Israel's commitment to help and weakening uh, Russia by you know, taking care of the Iran. And this actually might be interesting for them and then they probably would be, agree to snap back and impose sanctions again on, the, on Iran. Militarily speaking, they're useless. <laughs> Do you see this as only a function of if the United States tells the Europeans? Are the Europeans waiting for us to tell them what to do on Iran? I think that the they are waiting for the US to, 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 to say what needs to be done with Iran, not Israel. Is, uh, so we may I'm be not going to assist Israel if US is not leading the region. So we may be waiting for a while. Maybe. Who knows? Okay, yeah, you have a question. Uh, John Burlock, Competitive Enterprise Institute, thank you so much for this fascinating talk. Um, wanted to ask, what impact, if any, would um, uh, the BDS movement have on Israel's capability in a, in a war with Iran? And uh, uh, um, related to that, I guess, what impact would the war have on potentially on the BDS movement? And as a side, um, is the ESG, um, you know, sort of like a liberal corporate governance movement, which we've seen in the case of Sustainalytics, uh, which is required by Morningstar, has, has incorporated some of the anti-Israel, anti-Semitic bias of the PDS movement as far as rating companies. Would that have any effect on things like uh, Israeli companies or arms suppliers? Should, should there be a war with Iran? I don't, I don't think that if it's a war with Iran, we'll see the BDS being able to affect affect that. And anyway, uh, the only real country that is supposed to assist us in this scenario is the US. And I don't see the US government affected by, by BDS. Um, talking about BDS generally, and this goes back to what I said at the beginning of my presentation, I think that our whole approach in, the BDS is wrong. We are playing on their playground. They are saying this and that, and we are answering on their playground. And we, are, we shouldn't play on their playground. We have to have our own playground. 
And our own playground is mainly focusing on ourselves. Okay, we need to build the strengths and the business of the Jewish people. Because the biggest problem with BDS, it's not, uh, you know, their, uh, their ability to affect, uh, I don't know, uh, people selling us or not selling us things. They are destroying the Jewish people. They are destroying our identity. They are distancing Jews from Israel and from Zionism. And this is the biggest problem. They are pushing a narrative, very simple, very straightforward, saying Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. Where, is that? Where are the Jews in this uh, scenario? In the sea. Not about a two-state solution. They are saying we are European colonialists that came and conquered a country called Palestine. And uh, you know that the whole idea of basic Zionism, a house, a national home for the Jewish people in their homeland, is they reversed it completely. <clears throat> when they say that, when they say Palestine will be free from the river to the sea, what's your answer? No, oh, listen, you know, let's cut it in half, you know. You cannot go in this kind of story. You have to bring your whole story. Okay? There is no half story to the Jewish people. Thank you very much. I echo, I'm sure everybody here finds it extremely Juliana. encouraging. Yes, I'm Juliana Pilan with the Alexander Hamilton Institute and uh, a one contr once contributor to this illustrious magazine. You started by reminding the audience here that 10% of the problem is military, 90% is a matter of heart and, and soul. And it's encouraging to hear that teaching Zionism in Israel is working. Can you teach us in America the same concept? Because when you talk about uh, when you try to persuade Americans that they should be interested in their self-interest, that they should be interested in survival. This is, you think that you don't, wouldn't have to teach that to Israelis because it's so obvious. Well, you certainly have to teach it to Americans. Could you uh, help us figure out how we can teach patriotism in the United States and how we can instill a concept of, of self enlightened self-interest here too? So, you know, when we build the organization, the first three years we were really focused on building it in, in Israel. And this year we started uh, approaching the Jewish communities and saying, listen, we have thousands and thousands of officers, passionate leaders, uh, who can really ignite its values in the young generation here in the States. Um, and it's a very initial process, but I really encourage all of you to, to, to be involved in that in, in really bringing the power of the officers of Israel to the communities, uh, choose leaders, give them the tools to really know how to to convey these messages and, and build the resilience of the Jewish people in, in the diaspora. I also came to the World Zionist organizations and uh, I told them, listen, you guys, you are responsible for teaching Zionism. And I have an army. How can we combine this? But the uh, work with government is uh, slow. And the process of uh, really building something on the governmental level together with an NGO like us uh, it's a process, um, and definitely there is a lot, a lot to do. I, I published last week a book about all, all this concept. Uh, it was published in Hebrew. In two months, it will be published in English. Uh, and the, really, the book has the major keys of how to really solve uh, these issues in the long term for the Jewish people. Uh, Raymond Shurik here. Uh, a question about the the the, the coalition that you, that you're envisioning. Uh, first of all, given the the uh, 
the predisposition of the current administration of the foreign policy and leadership toward diplomatic engagement with Iran across multiple fronts, uh, I personally find it very difficult to imagine them switching sides and then going in the direction of a coalition against Iran. But let's assume that that was impossible. Coalition would involve uh, potentially the uh, partners in the uh, in the Arab Gulf. The question is, what role do you envision them having in a coalition? Active, passive, simply telling the United States and Israel, "Good luck." You know, you do all the heavy, heavy lifting. We'll, we'll set off on the side and wait. For us. How do you envision it? I think that to, to to deal with Iran, it's enough to have the U.S. and Israel as uh, uh, leading forces. Uh, but this is really something that uh, the U.S. administration should work out with them, how they want to be involved. Uh, they can be involved in reconnaissance, in missile defense, in, in many ways. Uh, we saw in Kuwait how the U.S. was able against Iraq to, to build a coalition with Arab countries and attack uh, Saddam Hussein. And, and again, in this attack, almost all the forces that were really relevant were American, okay? But still there were forces, uh, and it was important in order to say we are using a coalition, okay? This is part of the legitimacy when, when you want to really get also the support of your society. Say, so listen, it's not only about us. This is something that involves many countries and we are building a coalition around it. Um, when the US wants to vilify a country and attack it, they know perfectly how to do it. And there is all the reasons why to do it with Iran, with this regime. Peter. Would you further elaborate on the assistance Iran is giving Russia or Ukraine? You made a very interesting point that if Iran, if the embargo remained that they would not be able to help Russia. Yeah. But could you yeah. could you elaborate a little bit? Most on... of the attacks, the ones that actually are working for Russia, are done with Iran and UAVs, with the Shai. With this US, UAVs, they can reach uh, 2,500 kilometers, miles, no, 800 miles. That's a bit more. They have like 50 kilos uh, explosives and they are targeting all the infrastructure of Ukraine with these uh, UAVs. Uh, the Iranians are also uh, helping the Russians with missiles. These missiles originally were developed by the North Korea and they gave the know-how to Iran. And now Iran is bringing this uh, know-how to, to Russia. So Russia is using a um, using uh, the Iranian industry, which is very, very developed. I'll tell you something interesting about the Iranians. Um, six years ago, uh, my wife did a, a, an event fundraising um, for um, dealing with the, with the cancer. Um, you know that every soldier that goes to the army, they take saliva from him and, and develop the DNA. So if somebody needs a, a how do you call it? A treatment. 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 Transfusion. Trans 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 um, and, um, but this is for blood cancer. Yes. Um, and because it's thousands and tens of thousands of soldiers, it's, 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 there's a need of a lot of money to uh, to build this bank, okay, of DNA. The, the Israeli bank is the biggest in the world because we are the only ones that are taking all of our young society and taking them through this uh, process. And almost any Jew around the world that actually needs this finds himself going to the Israeli bank because Jews have a very good DNA wherever they live, <laughs> okay? Um, 
So we can say today, definitely, we as Jews, we have a specific DNA. But then, you know, there is a World Bank. You compare DNAs, you can compare DNAs between the Jewish DNA and all of the globe's DNA. Our DNA is not similar to any other uh, nation, a part of one, the Iranians. <laughs> and actually, it comes as no surprise. We were exiled twice to Iran, okay? Until 100 years ago, 20% of the Iranian society were Jewish. I would say that the vast majority of the Iranian society has Jewish roots. This is what makes them so smart. <laughs> this is why they are the only really country in the Middle East that is actually challenging us even technologically. Uh, so we're challenged by maybe half Jews. Mm -hmm. um, so that's our challenge, and uh, we need to do this. Let's take one. This is the last question. No, I'm going to take the last one. Oh. It's going to come from the computer, so you get the next to the last. On the one. same topic of Queen Esther and um, Purim anti-Semitism, we understand how the Iranians hate the Jews for their religious doctrines. In your coalition, putting the Arab world into into this equation, how reliable do you think the Sunnis are? And how do we know that they're not actually um, another type of anti-Semitism, for example, Hanukkah anti-Semitism, and they're not really into this in order to annihilate the Jews? As I said, I, I believe in interests, and uh, Iran is an existential threat for the Sunni world. The Shias, they are a real threat for them, and they're more than happy to cooperate with us to deal with this threat. One day when this threat will be gone, what will happen then with this relationship? I don't know, you know, we had amazing relations with the Iranians at the time. You see what happens now. We had very good relations with the Turks. It's also changed. Relations tend to change, they're not always the same. So as long we have, as we have common interests, I'm pretty sure that we'll work uh, together. Sure. A uh, question from an online viewer. From an Israeli perspective, what would the U.S. role be in helping to solve outstanding issues with the Palestinians? Does stronger U.S. leadership on this front help Israel improve relations with other countries in the Arab Muslim world? I didn't understand the question about the Palestinians. Can, can the U.S. be helpful there? The Palestinians? Okay. Um, okay whole talk about the Palestinians, but I will say one thing about the Palestinians. At, at the moment, the reality of the matter is basically they are divided into two. Half of them in Gaza are under Hamas uh, regime and they will never connect back. This is two completely different entities. Gaza is an Iranian front uh, and half of the Palestinians live there and completely detached from the guys that are living in Judea and Samaria. And in Judea and Samaria, the reality is that the Palestinian Authority is in the process of falling apart. Mm. There is a good chance that the day after Abbas, and we are working really seriously researching that, it's a very interesting talk talking about the day after Abbas. There is a good chance that the day after Abbas, the Palestinian arena in Judea and Samaria will go into chaos, will go into anarchy. Um, I'm not sure there will be a Palestinian Authority anymore. We will not let Hamas and Islamic Jihad take over. And this means we need new ideas. And one of the things we are doing in my organization is building new ideas. We have like four different solutions in the long term, which are completely different from the classic two state solution uh, that can be relevant in a post Palestinian Authority uh, reality. And we need to really think about that. You know, one of the things that amazes me is that, you know, the world, today everything is about innovation, right? I mean, I don't understand why when it comes to statecraft, people are so not innovative, like stuck with ideas that were not relevant even 30 years ago. And it's time to be innovative and think out of the box and bring new ideas that are actually connected to, to reality. And I think that one of the things that we're discussing and here in the States is saying, guys, you know, it's time to move 
to new ideas and let's discuss this idea. Of course, while talking about it, it's a really exciting idea. So if you have new ideas about Israel and Palestinians, we're going to have to have you come back. Uh, that to me is a whole no other problem. lunch, right? But at this moment, uh, I'm going to thank you for a really interesting and provocative because we, I think, as Americans, this Jews, I'm going to speak for Jews, that's scary. Um, don't often think about what goes behind our support for Israel, what goes behind our desire to see a strong and capable Israel. So you brought us, first of all, something to think about for ourselves, but also a really interesting perspective on Israel in the region and Israel in the U.S. and Iran. And I want to thank you for that. That's thank, thank you. you.